Smithsonian Design Museum, and I am thrilled to see all of you here tonight. Today and every day for the next three months, we are in the middle of a massive countdown at Cooper Hewitt. We're 93 days away until the reopening of the museum, so sometimes I have to check, do I have a hard hat on or do I not have a hard hat on? Um, so we're very, very excited to be nearing the end of the most ambitious renovation in the museum's history. And as most of you know, during the renovation, we really made an effort to keep the flag of Cooper Hewitt flying with talks like tonight, thanks to the Adobe Foundation. We also had exhibitions traveling nationally and globally. So when we come back, we'll be that much stronger and more well known across the world. The other thing I'd like to remind you of is next month is National Design Week, the second week in October, with the National Design Awards Gala celebrating this year's winners on October 9th. This is the 15th year of the gala. And if you don't know about it, check out our website. In fact, tonight, voting starts for the People's Design Award, and we have tw 20 very innovative products, and you can vote and populate our site and learn a lot about all of these different products. So please help us um, really make that even more visible and join us for the many events during National Design Week. There's an event every day of the week for every age individual. So, the renovation is complete. We're installing our cases. We're installing some of the design objects in anticipation of the December 12th opening. December 12th happens to be the exact same day that Andrew Carnegie moved into the mansion with his wife and daughter and a few servants. So we liked the, we liked the synergy there of opening the, the same time, 1902 to 2014. Very little about Cooper Hewitt will be the same. We've taken the time to really completely re-envision the museum experience, using cutting edge technology to make design and the design process come alive and transform all of you from viewers to participants. We took this time also to look at everything that has to do with the Cooper Hewitt experience. The moment you walk in the door at 2 East 91st Street, what the ticket looks like, what the website looks like, how you participate in our programs, and really change the way we're doing things. Our transformation is truly 360 degrees, inside the mansion, outside the mansion, and throughout the museum experience. So, given that, we wanted a new brand, we wanted a new typeface to signal the new Cooper Hewitt, a revived international resource for design. So we've worked with Pentagram now for nearly two years to redesign Cooper Hewitt's identity, which we rolled out this past June, complete with a custom typeface called Cooper Hewitt that we offered to the world for free. And as of about two hours ago, the font has been downloaded over 5,500 times. So we're really looking forward to how people use the Cooper Hewitt typeface. To talk about this crucial aspect of the new Cooper Hewitt, tonight I am really, really delighted to welcome Eddie O'Para, partner at Pentagram, and type designer Ch Chester Jenkins of Village. Chester, Chester and Eddie will first speak to you each briefly about their work on the Cooper Hewitt project, and then I'll join them for a discussion about how they work together, how they worked with us, uh, and all about the ins and outs of this particular labor of love. So over to the two of you. Hello, everybody. I'm actually going to um, sort of work like a clock when I talk. So I'm going to actually move like this as I'm talking to you. Um, I think it's best because sometimes if one's actually talking, you're always like, talking directly in front of an audience here, but it's very sort of like a, a nice, nice semicircle. Um, hi, I'm Eddie O'Para, and I'm one of the partners in the New York office in Pentagram. And I wanted to, you know, I wanted to start off this particular presentation um, with this terminology. Um, as you know, it's um, Latin. Uh, and um, there's one thing that I was actually asking my staff about, do you know what this is? And they actually really didn't. Uh, it was quite surprising. Anyway, I, you know, when I was a child, I 
you know, studied Latin. I actually did fail my Latin uh, GCSE. <laughs> um, but uh, E uh, Pluribus Unum is out of many comes one, or out of many is one. And the f this is a very important factor due to the, to the fact that it's part of the, the great seal of the United States of America. And it, it really has and pers personifies the ideals of what America stands for. And um, um, the idea of being united, um, coming as one. And one of the things that uh, the Smithsonian does is that it is a collection of um, museums, but also in an educational structure. And that's a, a very important factor that I, we wanted to bring um, up, up, you know, across. And one of the things that uh, we saw out of the, uh, um, you know, uh, the, the previous mark is the, um, the idea that the Smithsonian was, was seen, but the Cooper Hewitt actually wasn't. And, and the, 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 the naming of the National Design Museum also dictated a different type of understanding to people around the world and also in America. Locally, um, everybody knows it as a Cooper Hewitt. And so, you know, how can you go out and become an acolyte to, um, for, for people in, in the Midwest, in the Northwest, it, 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 you know, of America, um, and explain what the Cooper Hewitt is, they didn't really understand that. And that's one of the principles in regards to um, sort of making a system that was presentable in a, in a clearer idea. Everybody said the Smithsonian, that's absolutely fine, but they didn't know what the Cooper Hewitt was, thus they didn't understand what design was in regards to design learning and a design museum. And so one of the things that we tried to do at Pentagram was uh, with the Cooper Hewitt is what is the contemporary notion of the Cooper Hewitt? in name and visual identity. And so when we for, were asked to start this whole process, one of the things that we had to do was actually define, actually enrich in the name, help the, the Cooper Hewitt um, define that name structure uh, as well as the visual identity. And there was a, a plethora of names out there. And I won't really go into that particular um, um, idea or aspect because we don't have that much time but over the course of um, the, the, the the process um, it was laid out to us that um, and this is a very important principle where normally I've worked with many museums and normally you talk to the um, the board of trustees right at the end. This was an entirely different. It was on its head, which was amazing. And so you principally understood how and, and why they wanted um, the, the, the particular um, structure to be defined in a particular way. And it was great that we had this dialogue. It was very, very good. And this is just one of the um, sort of charrettes that we had uh, for the designs, and these are some of the things that we looked at. You know, look at the names, the Smithsonian Museum of Design, um, you know, whether it's actually uh, acronymed. Um, you know, these are the types of things that we sort of looked at. But, you know, in principle, you know, looking back it, and having a lot of dialogue with the, uh, the museum and also the board, board of trustees, was that it's not about, um, um, it's not about the pontification of layering of meaning, you know, the, the subjective meanings that you would have in the contemporary aspects of identities today. And it's not about decorativeness. Even though the, the shell of the Cooper Hewitt is a wonderful decorative uh, construct. And, you know, you have to think about what's within the, 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 the bounds, the vessel of the Cooper Hewitt, the aspects of design, the bold statements and actions of design and how they function, um, the bold weight, the, the, the sense of tailoring, the durability, the functionality of it. And that's what we wanted to do to reflect the actual identity and also provide a slice of fun where possible. And this is what we established. Um, as you know, um, uh, Chester will talk a little bit more about the type, the, um, how the type structure actually works. But in a sense, what we were trying to do 
was um, shape it in a particular way that it created balance and was very, very stern and also flexible. And so we did certain adjustments to it with the help of Chester. And these are, these, these are um, ex a video explaining how the different weight structures would actually occur. Because you can't just have um, the idea of one mark and, it, and, and how does that sort of pronounce itself across a whole branding um, exercise. It's very, very difficult. And we needed to establish a, a very versatile um, typeface that could do that. And this is how we would, would define it. We also considered that the Smithsonian Design Museum, um, which is at the bottom of the Smithsonian mark, would be at the foundation of the, um, uh, of the identity. And so what we would do is sandwich within that all the, the content to explain what's actually sort of going on. And this is the sort of system that we are actually working on and um, playing with at, um, as we speak. Another thing is that you have to think about all the subsets of, uh, of the Cooper Hewitt. It's not just the, the museum itself. It's the National Design Award. It's National Design Week. It's the People Design Award. And there's others. And so we, what we wanted to do is make sure there was a, a very um, concise system that, uh, um, that was generated. And then um, how does it apply itself to the magazine? This is something that nobody's uh, seen just yet, and we're still working on it. This is the sort of front and the, the back of the magazine, the interior, and how it actually sort of works through that. And so we've tried to um, you know, um, push um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and frame um, every part of the experience of the Cooper Hewitt with the uh, defining factors of this, um, um, this mark and um, the typography. And as you can see from the actual website um, that many of you may have, have gone to so far. So I'm just going to slowly go through these things. And, and so one of the things about uh, the, um, um, a lot of websites is that sense of logical consistency. After a while, you know, you go to one page, um, and then you go to another, and you go down in layers, and it starts to break apart. We did not want that to happen, and especially if you have the ownership, or you could say ownership, of this particular font, and you have it at your grasp. It's very, very sort of important. So we've tried to do that. We've also tried to establish it in, in regards to um, signage as well. So we're doing all the signage work from Michael Garricky's team at Pendigram. And the glorious pen <laughs> that uh, many are waiting in anticipation to actually utilize and uh, on, uh, on local projects interfaces. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. I mean, that's an apple comment, isn't it? It doesn't stop there. Um, the, the aspect of applying this system to the labeling structure for all the objects within the museum um, on exhibit is, is there. And it, it's, it's actually more than this. There's a large structure going on. And, it, and it, the great thing about it is that once you have this, you, you create balance. You, un, you start to understand the premise of having guidelines, of having a system, of having a structure. The interior of the bag, this is the sense of fun. This is one of the bags that we're actually dealing with. And this is the interior of it. How can you actually have fun with this uh, and, and playfulness with this particular mark? And so the factor of this is that at the end of this um, massing, we have this particular comment to say. And does anybody know what this means? I think, can you say that a little louder? Correct, sir. And that's the point. The premise was to define a system as one and then allow the public to take it and use it the way that they want. And that is what design is all about. Thank you. That was great. Um, so yes, that was cool. Uh,
Thank you, Eddie. That's illuminating and um, sort of gives me all kinds of things to reference when I'm talking because uh, I, I obviously have not um, super duper prepared. Um, before before we begin talking about uh, Cooper Hewitt, just going to show some some other work, some sort of uh, earlier work, and talk a little bit about Village because like who exactly are we? We're not we're not sort of some big name type people. Um, only seven or eight people know who we are. Uh, but we were founded in 2004, uh, launched our website um, on, in 2005, uh, Liberty, Equality, and Brotherhood, all that good stuff. And um, you know, over the years, uh, we've, we've been very fortunate to work with some fantastic designers, including Eddie and, and several of the other partners at, uh, at Pentagram, trying to collect the whole set. Um, but uh, we, we had a wonderful uh, project. We worked with an artist named Mary Ellen Carroll, who, uh, who designed this piece called, um, what is it called again? Here, Indestructible Language, uh, across five buildings in Jersey City. And uh, they, it was, uh, you know, it was there for, for a, few, a few months uh, after this factory was sort of prepared to be turned into condos. So, um, so we've worked with, with this you know, wonderful artist. Uh, these are all eight foot um, neon letters. Uh, we have the test one in our, in our studio. Um, we've also you know, worked for um, some, some interesting people beyond uh, you know, Maharam, the fabrics company, the late lamented New York City Opera, um, those people who who are in trouble at the moment. Um, the, the Performing Arts Center, that fashion brand, and that other fashion brand. So, so yes, when, whenever I see a young woman walking down the street and she has pink on her butt, I did that. Uh, <laughs> it's very, very exciting to know. Um, th this was, oddly enough, a project that more people were excited about um, than anything else. So I designed a typeface based on the Snicker, Snickers uh, logo. And, uh, and yeah, whenever I show that, you know, you can show them all the, all the cool stuff, the, the opera, you know, the, the museums. It's like, oh, Snickers, that's cool. Um, another nice project for the, the New York Times Magazine uh, for their ideas, uh, year and ideas issue, uh, where we made a 3D typeface that is um, much more 3D than most 3D typefaces. And uh, you know, this is how they used it. So, so yeah, we've been doing work for a long time. And um, call call came in from Eddie uh, in February of last year, and uh, he says, "Well, I can't I can't talk to you on the phone about this, but can you come in?" So I went up to Twenty Third Street, and uh, and then we we sort of he talked about this. He says, "We've got this." And that's, yeah, that's your typeface. That's Galaxy Polaris uh, condensed. So I was like, cool, excellent. And obviously tweaked you know, to, to make some alignments and stuff. It's like, great. And he says, would you help us just tweak it a bit more? So I did. So I tweaked it, and 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 I tweaked it some more, and a little bit more. And we tried some other things, and we did this. And I was like, OK, that looks Good, and that took that took like three weeks um, or fifteen seconds, whichever. Uh, so so he's like that was good. Uh, Eddie was like thank you very much, and um, you know moved on to the next thing. And I, I uh, you know didn't hear from didn't hear from Eddie for another another few months. And then in July he he calls up and says says so um, we've been working. With your, with your typefaces, with the Galaxy Polaris regular width and condensed, and the regular is too wide, and the condensed is too narrow. <laughs> so, what have you got <laughs> in the middle? And we happen to have semi-condensed that we, was kind of um, just very beta, lived on, lived on my machine, and that was about it. Um, so I sent that along, and he's like, perfect, great. So let's take the regular and the condensed, smush them together, you get semi-condensed. All right, but wait a second. 
they don't match. The, what doesn't match? Those things don't match at all. The, there's some uh, you know, forced alignments that we put in the, in the logotype. There's the, uh, the, the horizontal stroke terminals, which are not in the, the semi-condensed. Um, so it's like, well, we need it to look like that. We don't need it to look like that. That looks, that looks odd. So let's, let's, let's have a typeface that looks like that. And that is how um, the process all started of um, working on the, the Cooper Hewitt typeface. So, um, and so this was in October, mid-October, uh, started talking with the fine folks at the, at the Cooper Hewitt and they were on furlough. So, so you could talk to them, but you couldn't really talk to them because they weren't working. They were being shut out by the government. And, um, and so in, in mid-November, we figured out, wait a sec, so we, you know, we, can't, we shouldn't just tweak uh, Polaris semi-condensed, which was kind of beta and weird anyhow. Let's make something new. Let's make you know, something that is going to be just for the Cooper Hewitt. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to show a little bit sort of the, the odd little details of this typeface that make it um, you know, unique, very unique, as some people would say, even though you can't have something that's very unique. Uh, this, is, this is a regular old O, capital and lowercase O, from one of my typefaces, uh, four points in each, in each um, sort of you know, shape. Uh, with with the the handles which sort of dictate the curve between the, the points um, that's that's how you're supposed to make good typefaces nice and clean no no super, superfluous stuff nice outlines um, for the for the uh, Cooper Hewitt typeface I purposefully added these straight line segments that you can kind of see especially in the the left hand one um, in the in the counter the inside form at the bottom um, when you see it filled in you don't really see those things but um, I, I wanted to, to you know sort of break some 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 well long established rules about how exactly you're supposed to make a typeface so so that's what we did with with the typeface and um, you know, we have to, I had to sort of redraw. You can kind of see in this, there's, uh, I built the new typeface on top of the semi-condensed, um, just, just because we liked the stroke widths, we liked the, the actual letter widths, and uh, so we didn't want to, you know, remake that particular um, wheel. So, so we, we built the, the actual letter forms to sort of fit in with that. And when you're, you know, designing type, you, you often work, uh, with two poles, the, a light and a heavy pole. Um, as you're working, you sort of generate instances between those two to see how they work. Um, these are the, these are the two masters, the light and the heavy master from, from Cooper, uh, Hewitt, just for the lowercase a. And then you you sort of play out that um, that range, and um, and when we're working on type, you know, we, we don't just have the nice clean outlines. We sort of have all these these built up bits and pieces, which which we flatten at the end of the process. So so this is kind of how we we explore. We generate multiple instances, and I'm getting louder. That's much better. Uh, so that we can you know pick from from what we generate as what's going to be a good set, a nice working set. Uh, so, so once we sort of did those several weights, you make the, the uppercase and the lowercase and the numerals and, uh, and currency symbols and accented uppercase, because you got to do that, and accented lowercase, because you got to do that, and a heap of other stuff. So. Um, Diacritics, um, I, I always like to put an interrobang in my typeface, so that's that's at the top of the of the uh, the top row, or the middle of the top row, and um, I also like to do a, a sort of Spanish, you know, beginning interrobang because why not? Um, doesn't have it doesn't have any kind of Unicode point, which uh, people three people here will know what that means, but I, I do it anyway. Um, and you know, card suits, why not? Recycled logos, arrows pointing here, there, and everywhere, and, um, 
and all sorts. So, so once you do the Roman, then you have to go and do the italic. And I, I killed myself on this because um, by having all of those straight line segments, it made the italics just a, a nightmare to draw because when you're designing a typeface, you have um, all of your points, all of the, the sort of the control vectors, the nodes and the handles, uh, have to be on a thousand m unit grid. So um, you know you can't pull thing, pull something just a tiny little hair because it'll look better that way. It has to move a clunk, and so that changes the the uh, the curve. So um, so this is kind of an example of of what the uh, the italic would look like. It was just a sloped Roman, and then this is a proper italic. Oh boy, <laughs> this is like watching paint dry. So um, yeah, it's a, and and you know we have to do it for every glyph. So so all those all those glyphs that were in there, um, you know, have to do it for for everything, including this S set. So I, I sort of put this in here because the S set shows where some some places we have to have that angled straight line segment on the outside. Other places we have a nice up and down handle on the inside of the form. This totally inside baseball. So again, uppercase, lowercase. Numerals and punctuation. Oh god, more of those. Oh no. Oh god. Oh, okay. Oh, and finally, so um, we do this. You do this all for uh, seven weights in Roman and italic. Fourteen fonts. Um, Five hundred and sixty-one glyphs in each font. A glyph being a unique character. Um, so in the Cooper Hewitt at the moment, uh, seven thousand eight hundred and fifty-four glyphs. Um, and that's that's how we got there. Uh, and so, so when we were starting on this process, or actually a couple of months in, came in and met with, with Caroline, and, and she said, and we're so excited, it's going to be open source. And I was like, it is? <laughs> I'm so excited too, I guess. Um, most people you know, think that typefaces should be free. Um, nobody makes them, right? They've been around for hundreds of years. Uh, it takes months and months to make these things. and. Um, and so, so I've, you know, I don't give any of my work away. Everything I, I have, I either sell or I've made for a client and they've paid for it and that's good. Um, in this case, uh, we, we sort of were like, well, okay, it's, it's gonna be open source, but that makes sense because this is, this is the typeface for the National Design Museum. It's, it's owned by the people. You know, it's, it's um, by one of the people, for the people. And um, and so so yeah I, you know, and I thought that was very interesting. I'm you know very interested in how the Cooper Hewitt, especially in the Smithsonian, you know, as a larger institution, is is documenting everything, just everything. And um, and so everything that every piece of, of work that enters the the Cooper Hewitt collection is is you know studiously documented, and and you have access to that. You know, the, the people visiting the museum in person or online can really zoom in and see what's there. Um, there's you know, amazing things that are going to be in the museum, the, the wallpaper room. It's just I mean, some fantastic things that, um, that are, uh, you know, the Cooper Hewitt's collection. And this typeface is in the Cooper Hewitt's collection. So now this becomes part of, you know, it belongs to the people. And so, so you know, giving away the typeface, while well, it sort of it confused me at first, I, I, I got my head around it. Um, also, you know, free fonts. When you think of free fonts, you don't usually think, oh, that's going to be really good. You think that's going to be awful, and and the spacing is going to be horrible. It's going to be a dog's dinner and probably a dog's breakfast too. And um, so, so you know, we we wanted to sort of put something out there that was going to be free, that was not going to be heinous. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we really sort of like that, you know, the Cooper Hewitt put their money where their mouth was with this one. And, and so this is, you know, they commissioned a typeface and they gave it away. Um, and you go into a museum these days and, you know, you can't, you're not even allowed to take a picture. Here they're giving you their font. Um, so, so, you know, that was, that was why we were, we were excited about, about um, you know, open source after, after the five minute shock wore off. And uh, you know, I love seeing it on the website. Um, love seeing it in, in use. Um, love that it's been downloaded 5,500 times, 16,000 16, times from Font Squirrel. So um, yeah, people, people uh, hopefully will start using it. And um, 
I'm curious to see when that happens. So thank you very much. <laughs> Boy, good thing I took three years of Latin, Eddie. Boy, I understand your introduction there. <laughs> um, I, I, I actually re recall my, uh, the, the, uh, the poem that I had to uh, translate in Ovid, and I totally screwed it up ah. at the age of 16, so never mind. These things happen. Well, speaking, <laughs> speaking of being teenagers, I actually grew up with my grandfather's printing press in our cellar. And I was setting type at the young age of about four or five, and I had little business cards that said, Caroline Bowman, my brother's here, he'll remember that. Um, but I do want to rewind the clock with the two of you, too. When did you know that you wanted to be a typeface designer? When I was nine. Nine? Yes. What, what happened? Uh, I just was attracted to, abnormally attracted to calligraphy. Um, I was never horribly good at it. I'm still not a great letter drawer, but... Um, but yeah, I just I, I had my first commissions, writing all of my classmates' names on their report cards. Ah. Um, you know, so so I actually I had some insider information on on grades for a few hours there. I could have <laughs> I could have used it, but I, I I used my power for good. But yeah, so that was you know when I was nine, and I was always drawing letter forms instead of you know guns and tanks and airplanes and things. And then what happened nine years later at 18? What was your <laughs> pathway? Because we have a lot of students in the audience. So. Uh, well, I'm, I'm originally from Montreal, and I went to uh, Dawson College in Montreal, which is a, a CJEP, a sort of a, a technical school. It's a totally different educational system in Quebec than anywhere else in the universe. But um, wonderful system. I think it's great. And, and so I went to this technical school to study graphic design. And you know you, you study everything when you're there because you go in when you're 16. So you leave, you know, you finish school quite young, uh, high school, and then you go into college and study graphic design and you know learn to use a ruling pen, learn to do drawing from life, learn to you know do re research and documentation, warm gray versus cool gray, all this kind of stuff. So yeah, I just um, you know I never never studied art, but I did study design. And you used the, word, uh, the words anguish and nightmare when you were describing the, the process of coming up with the typeface for Cooper Hewitt. <laughs> it seems to me that it takes a particular character or personality to take this route of becoming a typeface designer. Is yes. That... Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> you. We're, we're all on the autism spectrum somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and Eddie, how about you? Tell um, us about, you know, nine years old, Eddie, were you... Well, um, I, I think the first um, um, chance I had um, that I understood what graphic design was, was um, I was asked by my mother to design a, a logo. It was um, a dove for her like women's association. We had a big argument <laughs> about it. Um, ah. uh, she wanted changes. So there were, <laughs> so there were rounds ah. of, of changes to do. Um, and I said I'd never do anything for her ever again. And I have never. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, it, re it really was when I was around 18. Uh, I actually wanted to be an architect. Um, and um, I, I did find out that uh, by the age of maybe, maybe 50, 40, 50, <laughs> you could build something you know, of, of substance. And I was like, I'm, I'm, yeah, I want to do something a little faster. And my friends were. Oh, yeah, we were in painting class, and um, he, he was like, you need to be a graphic designer. I was like, why? So he was like, look at your apples. They're <laughs> absolute circles. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I applied to um, uh, uh, the London College of Printing, uh, now called the LCC uh, in London. And, uh, um, and um, you know, that's my, that's my start. And when did the two of you meet each other and start working together? Uh, huh. Well, there is a certain somebody, yes. I think, here. Uh, my, my wife, Tracy, Tracy. and partner. <laughs> uh, and Tracy was a uh, student at, uh, at Yale uh, at the time. And um, I remember meeting uh, Chester in, um, in Chicago. Yes. Which I think the first time. And um, I didn't know so much about his, his work, but I knew who you were sort of working with at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, over the course of time, we, we, uh, we kept tabs on each other. 
And uh, I, I'd work with uh, at, uh, Tracy at 2x4. And, um, and um, you know, um, even through my, uh, my other uh, studio in the app office and up to, up to Pandagram. And so I know that, uh, you know, Galaxy Polaris is a, a labor of love, mm -hmm. um, that um, uh, Chester had designed it initially mm -hmm. for uh, Tracy's uh, thesis book. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's passion there. So, <laughs> you know, that's a good thing. Type of passion, not a nightmare. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Lots of positives, lots of positives. The whole process was incredibly collaborative between Pentagram, between Village, between all of the departments at Cooper Hewitt. We were coming up with a new branding, a new typeface. Everybody was involved. Um, I'm curious to know about when did you hit brick walls? Because I know there were some. I heard about some of them. And how did you get by beyond them, number one? And number two, what was the inspiration behind helping us come up with a branding that really worked for the new and transformed Cooper Hewitt? Um, well, I, I think, I think the, uh, the, the first, you could say it was a rubber wall, um, it, was, it was quite flexible, um, was the naming right. um, process. And, I, and it really wasn't from the, um, um, what we had devised. It was really from the, the Board of Trustees were very torn between two significant names. And I, I think the way that we sort of try to um, 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 simplify the, the process was to look at it from the point of view of how uh, the name would actually be utilized in different places and, and also how people would relay it verbally. And, um, and I, I think that that was a very uh, crucial point because um, it would have been very difficult if you had the wrong name to define a, uh, um, this, uh, this, this entity, this important entity. Um, and um, that, was the, the, that was the first um, uh, problem. Um, um, and, and, I mean, certain brick walls are, you know, they're, they're there to, you know, to be smashed down. But uh, I, I believe... Um, the, the, the sense that it, it's a big family, um, that this is another, um, another um, issue um, to a certain degree, but it's there because there's, there's so much content at the Cooper Hewitt that you have to relay. You can't just use one weight to define everything. It just won't work. The, the clarifications, the, the contrast, the, um, the hierarchy, just, it, won't, it, it just will not work. And, and so for us, um, uh, de devising a sort of interim sort of guidelines um, for third party vendors whilst actually still designing everything is a very, very hard task to do. Um, but, um, you know, I think from there you start to learn um, what's going on in the, uh, the, the, the mindset of somebody who's reading your guidelines. And it's, things came back to us and they were like, is this right? And you're like, no, it's, <laughs> it's nowhere near right. <laughs> and you say to yourself, God damn it. Um, um, no, uh, but uh, you, 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 you take it and you readjust it, you, re, you rewrite the, uh, the guidelines and make sure that um, these are the don'ts. You've, you're collecting the don'ts. It's amazing what people do. You think you've got it, you've got the system down, and then they come up with something entirely different. It's like, <laughs> what about this? Is, this? is this correct? It's like, no. It's just, <laughs> but we have, to, we have to connect this to this to this, and then you're like, oh, I see what you have to do now. And so it's a very sort of malleable, sort of fluid uh, approach, and we're, we're really getting there. Now, mm -hmm. in regards to defining it, uh, I, I think we, I, I think we were sent one from Jennifer today, and I think she, uh, your, your email was like, um, "Your head's going to explode on this one." <laughs> um, so, um, the, the, but the refinement of it by the third party is getting better. It, it, it has gotten better, um, and these, these are the types of brick walls that we're 
we've, we've and then challenges. For example, yeah. uh, well, Eddie shared some of the surprises, like our wonderful shopping bag. Oh. And yes. when that's okay. Um, <laughs> when you walk into the Cooper Hewitt in December, you'll see that the typeface just really sings on the ticket, on the pen, on the labels. Um, but one problem we had just this week is when the pen needs to be charged, there's a little light that appears on the pen, and we realized just few hours ago that we actually needed to move the branding, the Cooper Hewitt name, or it would be right on the light itself. Yes. So there have been things like that where yes. we're working, you know, hip to hip on working out how the typeface will be inserted into all of these different collateral pieces for the museum. Yes. Uh, um, so yeah. there, there's also one more with um, uh, local projects is actually using a sort of um, um, a software program, which is, um, it is open source, but it doesn't have a very good um, ty typography uh, engine. Mm. And, right. uh, and so we're trying to get around that as well, um, defining it in a, in a better way. So these are the things that, uh, that uh, crop up. Mm -hmm. It's fun. Yes. <laughs> Lots. So I want to get into the head of a typeface designer mm. even more, Chester. So tell us about, you know, I love watching that video of the iterations of the Cooper Hewitt typeface. Yeah, yeah. Talk to us about, you know, do you do that in the middle of the night? Do you think, you know, at two in the morning, oh, I should move the P over a little bit? Talk to us about that whole, that process. Yeah, well, um, you know, I, I was just going to say about, about the Cooper Hewitt typeface is, you know, especially and and about a lot of the work I do is you know low contrast sans serifs so uh, it's it's you know very plain um, plain sans serif typefaces not sort of your usual text serif typefaces like Garamond but of Helvetica and family um, and and so you know trying to find different different avenues in that particular you know design area because there's only so much you can do. You don't have mm -hmm. serifs, uh, but um, yeah, it, it's it's you can you can you you can be kept awake at night just you know running the software inside your head and um, and but yeah if you if you sort of you know build it well to begin with then hopefully it'll sort of it'll work for you and um, and you know, you can sort of squeeze out of it what you need as far as like the the weights that we needed on on this one, and and you know, like in the process, I didn't really show, but you know, we sort of built the the um, heavy to the light as as the gamut uh, that was covered by the superpolator, which is a wonderful piece of software written by um, uh, Eric van Blockland, um, a, a Dutch type designer and programmer, and and so we use all these wonderful small tools that have been written by type designers. Mm -hmm. Um, and and so we license from them and, and helps us build our types. So I, I had like the, the range, the gamut, the light to heavy, and then it's like, but wouldn't it be nice to have a thin? Yes. So, you know, when you're, you make that, that, that you have to go in and sort of, you know, do it all by hand. You have to you know, move every point in every letter form by hand on that one. Um, and, you know, for, for the longest time, that was how we had to do with things, and you know, God, for the very longest time, it was, they were they were like knocking it into metal, you know, right. in inverse yeah. and mirrored. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's like you know, it's 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 pretty. Made. We are we're very lucky. Like it, this typeface only took me, I think, four months um, of of work, pretty much full time, four months. Mm -hmm. um, that's incredibly fast. Mm -hmm. um, in you know, typeface terms, you know, a lot of things yes, they take years of, you know, picking it up, dropping mm -hmm. it, picking it up again. Um, so on that note, was there a moment when you said, "Okay, this is it. This is powerful. This works. I'm done." No, <laughs> <laughs> no, and thank God it's open source. So, so hopefully, <laughs> ho I, I will, I will be able to work with it. And you know, that's the other thing I should have mentioned. Of course, the, the source files, the, the, um, the. Uh, UFO files, which are the sort of the guts of, of the font design, uh, those are all available for, for download, and these and those are you know also what's counted in the the downloads. So right. anybody anywhere in the world who wants to download the files and open them up in their font um, you know management or font design software and you know move some points or you know I'm going to make the the Greek version of this I'm going to make a really 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 heavyweight I'm going to make you know a, a condense anybody is welcome to to you know add to it 
um, monkey around with it and and send it back, and we'll we'll probably have the same reactions to a lot of stuff. Yeah. No, they, what were they thinking? <laughs> <laughs> hopefully we'll have several dozen more downloads tonight. And we're, act we're encouraging all of you and everyone who's downloading the typeface to let us know what you're doing with it. And we're going to share it on the Cooper Hewitt website as well. So that we, can, we can really sh share how this is becoming a global typeface. So Chester, who do you look back to? What master typeface designer inspires you? Or wh whose work do you look at when you really need inspiration for a project, whether it was Cooper Hewitt or another project? Um, yeah. Uh, lately, my sort of my favorite designer um, from the past is uh, Morris Fuller Benton, who was American typeface designer, incredibly prolific. Um, you know, design Franklin Gothic and Trade Gothic and Hobo, which is one of the best typefaces ever. <laughs> really, generally, it's, it's amazing. The lightweights of Hobo are, are oh, fantastic. <laughs> and and this, this is the thing, nobody knows about the lightweights of Hobo. Um, so, so yeah, Morris Fuller Benton's work is amazing. Um, I know he was insane, but Eric Gill, the, the English type designer, um, was, was incredibly uh, interesting. And uh, I, I really like his work. But um, you know, I, I of of you know living designers. I have a lot of colleagues, so I, I really enjoy their work, enjoy talking with them, and enjoy sort of like batting things back and forth. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the the two sort of master type designers, uh, Matthew Carter mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Harald Unger, who's uh, who's one of my faves. He's kind of flies under the radar a little bit, but he's one of my favorite mm -hmm. designers and people. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I I would say Matthew Carter. Yes. Um, definitely so. National Design Award winner. <laughs> <laughs> have and, to add um, that in. And, and Adrian Frittiger. Um, mm. uh, uh, you know, uh, they, I remember when I was an undergrad, um, I, for some reason, I wanted to make a typeface that was just using your fingers. I was, I was at that stage of my life. <laughs> and um, and I, I said, oh, I, just, I would love Adrian Frittiger to do this. And... And I asked my teachers, and they said, oh, he's dead. So he can't be dead. Said, you, really, he can't be dead. So I, I, I did a little research. He's, he's not dead. <laughs> <laughs> he's very much, he was very much alive. Yeah. And um, I contacted him. I, um, I actually got one of my very good friends who, who speaks uh, you know, uh, fluent uh, German and, um, to talk to him. And um, he did it. And uh, I have the photograph somewhere. <laughs> cool. um, somewhere in, in, uh, in my house and uh, it was, it was all, all inspiring when I got a letter and all these photographs of him of every single yeah that was that was wow. something yeah. <laughs> yeah. master master yeah. so uh, yeah. yeah those are the I would say those are the two and, uh, and then in regards to um, I wouldn't say young and up and coming but absolutely genius and young is uh uh, and I just spotted him, <laughs> Mr. Freya Jones. Hello. <laughs> Exceptional, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Absolutely. Another, that, is he from the National Museum? Yes. No. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Another, yeah. One after the next. Yeah, yeah. One after the next. One in our midst. So getting back to our working method and how we came up with this new branding and the new typeface, the collaborative process was really quite stunning to me. Um, how is the Cooper Hewitt collaboration different? And how is it different from some of your other Ooh. projects? <laughs> uh, I, I would say when it comes to cultural, or, uh, museum cultural projects, um, as I had, had stated earlier, I thought it was absolutely, I, I will name no names in regards to other museums, and they are in New York City. Um, <laughs> close, not, uh, we'll you know, start guessing. A, you know, I'll say about, uh, 10 to 15 miles away. No, um, <laughs> the, the, the situation is that um, of organization and of also uh, making sure that you have direct contact with the people in charge. And so talking to Caroline um, and also Jennifer um, and Jocelyn is an important factor. That immediate uh, access to Seb is uh, is absolutely m a must, and um, the whole approach of bringing in the, the the trustees early on and understanding what the process was to accept 
uh, what we're doing is so paramount. Imagine if you had worked so hard to produce um, a, a very good designs uh, for a museum or a cultural institution and then found out that somebody in that, um, one of those trustees hated it. And this has happened, oh, yeah. hated it and, um, and just wiped it off the face of the earth even though it was accepted by the whole museum, by the administration, by the directors. That is not fun. It sounds and, like it's happened to you. Oh, it has <laughs> happened. And, um, and you have to start yeah. all over again. That is not a good um, philosophy. That's not a good um, uh, methodology to utilize. And, and turning it on its head, having a very a good one-to-one -one relationship with the uh, people in charge is a, a very paramount um, uh, issue with, for designers today. And as you can see, um, there is so many more middle men, as middle people, that it gets very much muddied and it's very, very difficult to deal with um, uh, in this uh, um, day and age. I would say there, I mean, that's the beauty of the size of Cooper Hewitt. You know, you can't yes, do that yes. in a massive institution. But with, you know, 71 staff and 35 very involved, dedicated board members, we felt it was really important to launch right out of the gate and start the discussion and really address the problem at hand, which was twofold. You know, right, we wanted right. a new name and we wanted a new typeface and a new, a new mark. Right. So there were a lot of things going on and early discussion and early adoption is the way to go right, to absolutely. avoid exactly yeah. the kind of catastrophe that can happen with absolutely. one or many board but, members or staff that don't like right. something. Exactly. So, and, and the factor is, it does happen with a company such as Apple. You know, it, it has and it will carry on because they believe in the aspects and the power of design. And if that's there, then you know that you, you're on to uh, in the right direction. Yeah. So another question, I see a lot of students, so I keep uh, rewinding the clock, but I'm curious about, you know, you both graduated thinking, okay, I'm gonna be a designer, I'm gonna be a typeface designer. How was reality different once you were in the workplace for a couple of years and had real experience? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so um, that's a really good question. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I, grad, I, I graduated undergrad and I went immediately uh, to graduate school because I was so scared <laughs> of, of, of going into the professional world. I really was. I was like, oh, I'm so not ready for this. Uh, and so I, I did my, my, uh, my graduate um, um, education at, at Yale and, and then I left. <laughs> Same thing happened. Um, <laughs> I, 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 you know, you finish your thesis. You think that this is the um, ultimate document that will deliver your future, and it is not. And you know, it's sort of uh, you think it's a prescription to the way that you're going to work, and it's so not. Um, and because you start to understand the the, the sort of outside forces. Um, uh, of of the work environment of 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 dealing with so many different people um, in so many different professions and 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 they don't understand the word you're you're talking about and 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 so for me I I moved to um, Cambridge Massachusetts um, I went into the uh, into the world of you, now it's called the startup but uh, uh, a small band of, of guys called Art Technology Group in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that, that is now owned by uh, Oracle. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I started developing applications and, 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 and introducing them really more so to graphic design. And I loved it. And then I, 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 um, uh, I did that for four years and I, I wanted something, an, another challenge, and I moved to New York City. And again, you think that you have it in your hand and you're like, I'm going to go to New York City. I'm going to show them what I've got. And it just, it, it's like Mike Tyson, like, hitting you with a left uppercut. And biting <laughs> off your ear. <laughs> yeah, and biting off your ear, right? <laughs> and um, and that, that, that's what occurred, you know. Um, um, but you start to, uh, if you are not a sponge, New York will just not work for you at all. And that's, you just have to absorb everything that, it, that, uh, that, it, that it's got. That it's uh, that it's given you, and the work ethic that you must have um, 
is it's, it's astounding, um, more than any other city I, I know of. And, um, um, and so that's my sort of my, my, my feeling. And now, now I'm sort of like a, you know, a partner in Pentagram. Um, I, I've sort of ventured from a sort of small company that actually got really big um, to a medium-sized company, to a really sm uh, to a small boutique company, a two by four, to an even small company called uh, Map Office, and then what I always wanted was family, and as I wanted to be part of a family of designers, um, and you know whether being dysfunctional at certain points, and 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 but but incredibly loving that, uh, and and insanely skillful, and that's Pentagram. Um, and um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a love affair. And behind the scenes at Pentagram, did the brothers and sisters tear apart different iterations of the Cooper Hewitt typeface ideas or branding ideas? Paula saw it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> she sits next to me. And she's like, "What's that?" <laughs> 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 With the like, current like, one? Or, <laughs> what do you uh, mean? What's that? What's that? Um, and uh, I tried, I explained it to her, and then she just, she was like, and then walked off. <laughs> 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 she did this and then walked off. Later on, actually, if, uh, it's about, I would say four months later, she came back and she says, I get it. Hmm. She actually did. And hmm. uh, she said, I totally get it. Hmm. And that was, that was great. That was great to know. Um, so that was the only, only time. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So Chester, how about you? Yeah, well, I was going to say the one thing about you know, this process that was different from other processes is that I was completely hands off. I just you know, was left to do and make, and I delivered it. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I, and I, it's because it's like it was understood what I was doing anyway. <laughs> so, um, and I was, I was not going to be an infant and do something crazy. I was just going <laughs> to... <laughs> make a nice, useful typeface. Um, but yeah, no, so, so, so my, you know, I, I'd always drawn letters and, and things, but I, you know, studied graphic design and, and graduated uh, when I was 21. And, um, you know, this is, this is when being a type designer was actually, the, the software was a little bit harder to come by. There was something called Fontographer, which was, um, which you know still exists, but it was you know it was very rough and ready back then, and and so you could sort of build stuff in Photographer, and and I learned to do that at my f my first job. I had two jobs when I graduated from school. Uh, I worked from nine until three at the design studio of one of my professors, and then I walked to my other job uh, and worked from four until midnight at a um, a, a typesetting house back mm. when there were still typesetting houses, when mm. not every design studio necessarily had a Mac. So they, you know, they had, they were doing photo, you know, typesetting, uh, as well as, um, you know, Mac typesetting and, and stuff. So a lot of car ads, a lot of car ads came through, and, and it's like you have to wow. make it work for this newspaper, and then that newspaper, and then this newspaper, and, you know, the same content, and then you know, the text would change minute by minute throughout, throughout the evening. And so, so you know, I, I sort of, I, I did that, and that was um, actually not that stressful at all. It was pretty fun. Wow. Um, long working hours. Yeah, long working hours. So I, I did that for around six months, uh, where mm. I, I did both jobs. And, um, and one of my colleagues at the, at the typesetting house uh, was a real type history nut. Uh, he was like, you know, unilingual French, but he had all these wonderful, like, English books, this, this great, um, this, great uh, this book called The History of Printing Types and Their Uses by, um, by uh, Daniel Berkeley Updike, which is like the, um, the history book, mm -hmm. and it's published in 1912, I think, the original, the first published, 1912, something like that? Tobias, no. 20-something? 20-something, yeah, so 1920-something. And he had a first edition signed by Daniel Berkeley Updike, and he let me borrow it. Um, so that was cool, and um, and that's where I got to work with Fontographer because you know it cost four hundred dollars or something. Um, so so you know I did that, and then you know uh, I I had the same kind of feeling that Eddie did when I graduated from college. I really I actually wanted to go to LCP, <laughs> which was the cool. hot shit. You know? <laughs> so so yeah, I mean, and all the cool designers are coming from LCP. 
in, in the early 90s. So I wanted to you know, move across to London. I, you know, my parents are Brits, I have a British passport, so I was like, cool, I just moved to London. Um, so I, 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 and I thought I was gonna do that while I was working at these, these jobs. And I ended up moving to London, but not, not to go to LCP. I ended up moving there to work at a design studio called Newell and & Sorrel. And I was there for two years, um, you know, one in London, one in the Netherlands. And all the time I was like working on doing typefaces and I did some you know, types for clients there as well as, um, as doing you know, just ones on my own which were used for, for projects at the studio. And one was published by, by Font Shop International. And, and that sort of, you know, the type thing led me to my next job in Chicago. So I sort of, you know, went from Montreal to Chicago the very long way. Um, and, and, you know, that's where I, I be, worked with, you know, a, a designer who was, um, who, who, you know, had a, an interest in type design as well, but that wasn't his real, his real forte, you know, graphic design was his real forte. And so I sort of ended up being the type guy there. And then, so, you know, we started a foundry there and, or really built it up. And, um, and then, you know, when, when Tracy was graduating from Yale, we're like, well, let's move it. Let's move to New York. So, um, yeah, and you, yep. being a sponge, being a sponge in New York. I think mm -hmm. London's spongy, too. It's, it's, <laughs> it's spongy. It's more strawberry sponge. Kind yeah, of yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, it, it's the same thing yeah. where you're on the tube and you hear a lot of languages spoken. Yes. And, and so, like, that, I love that it's about... A, it's a little about, sweeter. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, yeah, so New York and, and London are sort of good places Absolutely. To, to be a sponge. So I have one more question, and then we'll open it up to all of you for your own questions for Chester and Eddie. And that is, in transforming the Cooper Hewitt over these last three years, we are really striving to become the contemporary design museum. So just some examples include, we're slipping LED lights into the stone pillars on 90th and 91st Street. So people that are jogging in Central Park or exiting the Guggenheim will say, what are those lights? And then they'll approach and say, oh, of course, it's the design museum. Yeah. We're also opening the garden for free. You don't have to be a donor or a member. We're really welcoming everybody and embracing everybody so that it becomes a true destination. And we're going to have an incredible cafe in there. I can't tell you who it is yet because we're still uh, inking the contract. But the point is to really make it a destination and a place to see and experience contemporary design. And on that point, we were all really, really pleased at, at Cooper Hewitt with the new branding and mark and just how contemporary it felt. And I wonder if you two could just talk a little bit about your feelings about the Cooper Hewitt typeface, how it does make us that much more contemporary and a more of an energetic, alive brand. I'll start off with Minion. Um, <laughs> I don't know if, um, I think it was my uh, fourth or fifth slide, um, the, actually fourth slide, um, it, it had the, uh, the sunburst, the Smithsonian, and then uh, the Cooper Hewitt in italics, um, and that's Minion, and um, um, there's, there's, there's a lot to be said about that. Um, it, it is not contemporary. No. Um, it, 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 it was part of a family, but uh, the family didn't want to use it. <laughs> they still don't want to use it as, 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 as much as people think. And, uh, um, and it didn't really, it really showed the sort of the outside of what the Cooper Hewitt is, very decorative, very, um, um, it's very stylish, um, the, the Carnegie uh, Mansion but it doesn't really show you the interior of it. Um, and when I say contemporary, I mean, uh, you know, you could say it of this time, but then you can take it and look at all the objects and look at it from their time, and they, they were all contemporary. Yeah. And that's how we, uh, we've, you know, we've sort of tried to mold this particular um, um, design where you have um, these objects that are um, some are more functional than others, but they are contemporary of their time. They are well refined and they're incredibly tailored craftsmanship. And that's what we wanted to sort of allow to breathe. And, um, and the thing about me being a graphic designer is that, you know, there's a sense of craft, but there's no, there's, this is the craftsman. 
And, and so that's what needed to actually occur. Um, craftsmanship is not dead. Um, the factor of it being um, transposed onto, uh, into an electronic um, realm doesn't mean that you don't have an amazing skill set to produce amazing work. And that that's an important thing to state. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that, yeah. that's, I sort of, I kind of, that's my goal, is, is to be a craftsperson and not just, you know, I'm not a designer. I mean, I make bricks. I always tell people I'm not the architect, I just make the bricks. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, the, the Cooper Hewitt typeface is, was meant to be um, just, you know, of this time, some of the, you know, the details I was talking about, the straight line segments, um, that are in there and just, you know, how I, how I built it is, it could really, you couldn't have done that um, 50 years ago, certainly, you know. Mm -hmm. But, um, and, yeah. And, and so the, the, the thing is, and I know we, 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 we're, we're sort of like on a bumpy road to getting it to, to work correctly, um, as we can probably see today, it's kind of cut off at the top of that. Um, <laughs> but um, the, the, the factor is that th this rubs off on people. It rubs off on the administration. Uh, it rubs off on the um, um, the members of uh, of the institution, and also um, of anybody who wants to go and uh, and and and, exp and have an amazing amazing experience from all corners of the world. And that's that is a, a, an important factor. For our uh, press preview a couple of weeks ago, we set up a putting green on the third floor of the Cooper Hewitt because Andrew Carnegie used to practice his putting on the third floor. And as a gift for the editor, top editors who were there, everyone went home with a Cooper Hewitt cap with our new branding. And so when an editor called me yesterday and said, I just won a tennis match wearing the Cooper Hewitt cap. <laughs> <laughs> I like, That's because it's so nice. dynamic. It's, uh, so. Aaron Chilich. <laughs> 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 so on that note, I'd love to invite the audience um, up for questions. We do ask that you use the mics because this is being recorded so that our listeners can hear your questions. All right, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> no, here's one. Hey. Um, Shannon, I'm an undergraduate student at the Fashion Institute of Technology over there. Um, I just have a quick question. Before you approached the museum, or you were commissioned for the project, right? How many times were you able to go to the actual institution and kind of feel around the environment knowing that this would suit it well? Oh, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good point. Um, you know, I, I've been to the, the Cooper many, many times and, um, you know, shows and parties and and um, the the the, fa the factor is um, it's quite uh, it's quite a striking e even though you've got the Guggenheim down the road it's quite a striking uh, uh, building when you, when you see it uh, across the road from uh, Central Park and um, so there's a variety of times that uh, I've, I've been there but um, the the factor is it, 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 in a sense it's not the architecture that uh, that, that that this is. Um, this 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 was actually built for. It's the objects inside, and so um, the objects can be found online. They can be found in the everyday, um, and also in the museum as well. And so that that was a major factor um, um, to proceed with. As well. The other thing I'd add to that is Eddie and the team at Pentagram are part of the Cooper Hewitt family, and know yes. everybody. You know, so yeah. when they're yeah, talking about you know designing the bag for the shop, they're talking to the shop staff. You know, and that happens with every single piece of collateral. So it's, that's why we keep stressing this collaborative effort. It really yes. has been in, incredible. This is actually for Chester, and it's very esoteric, and it's just been sticking in my head for the entire talk. But so if you have to move for your italics, if you've got to shift everything over, and you have to deal with PCPs like not lining up correctly, yes. why not draw it in true type where you have higher resolution? Is that a stupid question? No, it's a good no, question. It's a good question, <laughs> it's a good question <laughs> because I'm a bit dumb. Um, no, I, I, I just, I'm used to working in my 1,000 units instead of 2,048. Yeah. Um, and 2,048 just you know, hurts my head to think about. No, I, I yeah, I, I, I built it as open type with you know, postscript outlines, and um, you know, which is what 
Eddie and team are using. <laughs> and, yeah, I think uh, OpenType's better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I just, uh, I just worked, I just worked in OpenType. So, um, yes, I worked in 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 that language instead of. Uh, but it's it's a good point. It's a good point. Plus, the hinting would be better. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Dean Grossman. Uh, thank you to all three of you for your time and speaking tonight. Um, I have a question more aimed at Caroline, but of course, if you guys want to um, share some insights, that's great too. I'm curious what the selection process was like for the design firm, um, <clears throat> Pentagram. What were sort of the things that you guys were, excuse me, <clears throat> looking for mm -hmm. in a firm? And you know, without naming names, what are some of the things that other firms maybe were missing? that led you to kind of cut them out of the mix and then go with you know, Pentagram and mm -hmm. Intern Village? That's a really great question. Um, there were five firms that we were looking at that had experience in the museum realm or the nonprofit realm, and we interviewed each of them at length. And we were really looking for a design team that could work with our new direction with technology. Um, that was a major part of this. And given Eddie's expertise in that realm, it really was a perfect fit because we needed the, the brand, the new brand and the new typeface to work across all different platforms, which it is proving to now with a little bit, a lot of elbow grease. Um, but that was really the main thing that we were looking for. Yeah. The, there's, that flexibility. There's a lot of technology that, you know, there's website, but there's other technologies that, you know, are, are going to be upon us very, very soon. And as I hinted um, to Jake Barton and his team, his wonderful team at Local Projects, um, the, the, the factors of making sure that uh, um, the typography is correct and, um, and how that UI is actually going to work correctly with it is incredibly important. And then how that um, the aspects of the labels with, with the pen is going to um, um, going to work as well. And um, so that sort of versatility is there. Um, yeah, yeah. There are 15 digital tables peppered throughout the new Cooper wow. Hewitt. So, you know, the new branding needed to work on those digital tables for that digital experience, but it also needed to work when you received your ticket at the admissions desk right. on paper. Right. So, and Pentagram was the perfect team, and Eddie's team was the perfect team to, to do it. Great. So, Thank you. You're welcome. welcome. And they got me because that you just happened to use my typeface, right, Eddie? <laughs> <laughs> That's really what I got. Pretty much. To. Pretty much. Could have been <laughs> anybody else. Yeah. So. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dottie Jeffries, and I have a background in museum publications and product development. But I'm interested in large um, about your thinking on all caps in logo identity these days, and if there ever was a point with the Cooper Hewitt logo, since the previous logo was in uppercase and lowercase. Well, but anyway, I'm just I'm yeah. curious in general what your yes. feeling is. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think we were just having this conversation today. We wanted to um, be bold. You, <laughs> you wanted to be bold, and the, the factoring is that if you really write it, you know, you sort of create it in sort of upper lower case. You've got a lot of um, you've got descenders um, dealing with P's. Um, not if you use hobo. No, <laughs> you should have used I'm hobo. I'm not going to go into hobo, actually. <laughs> Late, later on, I will. Uh, um, there's, there's a lot of character in upper lowercase. And um, you want something which is emboldened, which is, could be quite a, iconic, but also um, you know, um, um, typographically set. Uh, very very well, and uh, and 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 um, and also seen from distance, and um, uh, so it's uh, uh, and also scale. So uh, I, I, you know that that was that was important, and also to the fact of that we wanted it to be really quite striking, um, make a statement. Um, yes. and, and figured out also that it, it was just like a couple of hairs away from being a perfect two to one two to ratio. one so right. Just Make yes. that happen. So exactly. now it just locks up in all kinds of cool ways. And I, you know, as as Chester had actually sort of explained in regards to, especially with the W, you know, when you if you just type it out, it's just like it it's all shifted. Everything's shifted. And so, how do you get that those characters, those glyphs, to actually fit correctly and and align like soldiers? And um, that's 
that was very, very important. And the answer is you force them. <laughs> yes. And that's yes, what the logo type is, whereas the, yes, you know, the type do. has a different logic. Type has a typographic but logic, logo has a logo logic. It does. And, and I think also where, we, where we're using in the sort of subsets, we want to repeat that. So sometimes the, the Cooper Hewitt mark may not be there on, on the page. Uh, it might be below or behind on, on, on a book. But you want to make a statement and say, hey, that's, 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 that's Cooper Hewitt. And uh, so there's, there's a sense of identity all the way through the, the structure. And I must admit that I you know, made the work and handed it over and really didn't see it happening, you know, what you guys were doing with it. Sorry. I went to, I think, <laughs> don't expect to. But, um, you know, I went to the, the press uh, launch and saw the labels on, on objects, and it's like, okay. It works. It works. It works. It's, <laughs> it's neutral. It's just sitting there, you know, in yeah. uppercase, lowercase. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it just, it's, it just me it's not meant to, to mm -hmm. you know, be something you see. It's just meant to be something you read. At least yeah, the typeface. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Hi. I just have to say, I love the granular nerdiness that we're getting to here. It's <laughs> pretty amazing. So I, I'll preface a very simple question, maybe in a little bit of a complicated way, because in museum exhibitions, I think especially in design exhibitions and working with curators, there's often a sense that each exhibition has a particular identity, mm -hmm. and that often plays itself out visually. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, will you ever use another font? And if so, how and why? Oh. Oh. Hobo. Well, that's <laughs> Hobo, hobo. <laughs> that's an excellent question. Um, certainly not for the first year or so. Um, part of our philosophy is to really promote and advertise the 10 opening exhibitions at Cooper Hewitt as one, to really encourage people to come to the museum and then explore those 10 exhibitions. If we were to do, though, an exhibition on a typeface designer, for example, we would obviously explore, Eddie, don't Yes. Hit me. No, I'm not gonna. Uh, we would explore the usage of something other than Cooper Hewitt, but it will be, you know, primarily what you see. This is why museum. you wanted me to sit between. The, right the, there, you go. Right there, there, there is, there is, and we're still working on this. The, the, in the magazine, um, <laughs> there, we're looking at the factor of a serif, but we're not quite sure. But to you Liz, here Quinn's, first, folks. Liz Quinn's question, <laughs> to answer it, um, um, uh, you know, Caroline is absolutely right that we are not going to. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't seen the magazine design yet. I think so, we're seeing that on Tuesday, right? So I don't know when Liz w went. Oh, so. Right. See, yeah. you're, you're causing uproar over here. <laughs> Anybody else so. want to throw a rock into a puddle? <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, Armstead Booker, Director of Design for the Natural History Museum up the street. Um, off of that very excellent question, um, curious if you could provide any insight to um, discussions that you've had about what it looks like to uh, future-proof a font like this? What is it going to look like if we had this conversation five or 15 or 25 years from now? And um, does that even matter? Um, 25 years from now, I'm going to be retired. So <laughs> I'm not going to say it doesn't matter. Um, I, I think it's, that's, a, that, that's a very good point. Um, I believe that. Um, the the way that design works is that if if it functions it, you know if it works don't don't, don't fix it um the, the 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 factor also is that if it has um acolytes or, um personalities um characters that um um that basically um love to utilize it it needs to be loved to be uh, to be useful, as well, that it will carry on, and 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 on and on and on and on. So there's no need 
uh, to find anything else. Now, whether it's going to work in the same constructs is, is another thing. We know, you know, 15, 20 years, 25 years down the road, we, you know, you know, I think we were going to be on the uh, iPhone 25, <laughs> uh, you know, and I don't know, what, 31. You know right. what's, you know, what's, what's, what's going to happen. Big. But um, but in but in any case, I, I you know I don't think this is this is not this is not the Helvetica of the, of the ages. Let's put it that way, where you've got some really staunch supporters, but you should have some acolytes that that that, that will take it on and and look at the attributes that it's uh, that that it's uh, um, that it's got, and and, um, and um, it will make. Um, the the work so much easier. It can the possibility of it expanding as well mm -hmm. um, is also. That's why it's, you know, that's why it's out there too. Also that, and the possibilities of creating a serif <laughs> come about as well. <laughs> From the museum standpoint, I mean, we certainly hope that it will be durable for decades. Um, I have a lot of confidence that it will be. I think when you look back at the marks in the past, the, Cooper Hewitt, the, the logo looks very, very dated. And who knows, maybe people will say that in 15 years, but I, I highly doubt it about our new typeface. I, I agree. I really agree. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. I do agree. Eddie and Chester, thank you so much for helping vivify the Cooper Hewitt brand and for tonight's talk. Thank you so much, and thank you to all of you. We, wel we look forward to welcoming you back in 93 days. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.